thank you. Uh, thanks for having the opportunity to discuss this paper. Um, uh, I guess I'm standing behind you in lunch, so I'm, I'm going to try to be, uh, be efficient and quick. Um, yeah, so, so this paper is about multinationals, and as uh, Paul said uh, earlier this, uh, this morning, these firms are hugely important for trade in the global economy, so I very much appreciate uh, the effort in, in looking into these firms in particular, uh, and I also think it's super interesting. So a big part of this paper is, is simply descriptive uh, to, to document uh, facts about these contractions and expansions. Uh, and I think that's a very valuable exercise that you do. Um, so you document these facts for the period 2010 to 2020. And you ask the, the question, well, are we becoming deglobalized or, or, or are we not? Uh, I have some uh, uh, comments there, but, um, but that's, that's the question. Um, and I think this is very useful because we can use these super rich microdata to, to compl complement what we know from more aggregate uh, data sources. Um, then there's the question about reshoring. Uh, do we see that these affiliates are like moving closer to, to Europe uh, during this period or, or, or not? Um, and as you ended with, it, there's also this analysis part here where the question is, uh, well, if we do see contractions, uh, how does that affect uh, Europe, European employ employment and value added uh, among the parents or the domestic um, affiliates? Um, yeah, so I think this is important, uh, pulse relevant, and of course super timely, uh, and also super relevant for this particular uh, conference, I think. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm also going to show a picture on uh, uh, global trends uh, uh, since the 1990s, uh, but this picture is different. Uh, so, uh, so the blue line here is FDI, foreign direct investment, um, uh, whereas the, um, let's see, um, the, the trade line here, which is the one you've seen uh, multiple times now, is the, is, is the uh, brown one. So, so as been mentioned multiple times, like uh, trade actually seems to be going uh, up uh, with GDP more or less one to one, uh, even in the last few years. So there's no real notion of deglobalization when you look at trade. But, but when you look at FDI, actually it looks a little bit different. So it's almost as if you see like a trend shift around 2010, and then it just flattens out. So again, I wouldn't necessarily say that this is deglobalization, but it's definitely some kind of stagnation. Um, and it's also interesting to see that this doesn't really coincide with like the Trump tariffs or global like geopolitical tensions. This happens around 2010. And I still don't really think we know why. Uh, is it about like a general slowdown in the deepening of global value chains? Uh, it's about, is it about technology, that you know, technology is becoming more important compared to labor? Uh, or is it something about the green transition, something along those lines? I, I don't think we know. But these, these are the facts from aggregate uh, uh, data. Um, okay, so, uh, so Bruno showed this, this picture. This was like the, the fact number one. Uh, where he identified these episodes of contractions or expansions. Um, and he's counting the number of them um, for, for each year. And like the takeaway here is that, well, something seems to be going on from 2017, right? And you see that contractions are clearly going up and expansions are, are going down. Um, and from this uh, piece of evidence, they say that, well, these results point to a relatively strong trend towards deglobalization. Uh, so here I want to push back a little bit. Uh, can we conclude, like, is that the conclusion based on this piece of evidence? Um, well, at least I would like to see more. Um, for example, like, you know, what, what's the number of affiliates uh, per year in, in your data set? not doing these episodes type of thing, just like simple counts of the, how many affiliates do they have on average and what's the median. And I think also you mentioned that, well, this is an analysis where you, you take into account mostly the extensive margin, you're counting num the number of affiliates. And that's, that's nice, but it's also a constraint, right? Because 
what if you know a multi, uh, European multinational uh, has two uh, two affiliates, one in Thailand and one in Malaysia, and then they just consolidate that to one plant in Malaysia. Okay, so that would look at that would be an, a contraction according to your data, but it's not really a, a decrease in multinational activity. They're just consolidating stuff. Uh, right, so and it's a little bit difficult to get around this problem based on your data, but I think at least one thing you can do is, well, you know the size of these multinationals in Europe, right? So you could say something about, well, is it the big multinationals that are contracting? Is it the small ones? Because that at least gets us a little bit closer to like the aggregate impacts of these kinds of findings. Or you could just simply weigh the average number of affiliates by parent size, for example, something like that. Yeah, yeah. the second bullet point, I, I guess I already uh, uh, said this. Uh, well, if there's a shutdown or you have like a minor showroom in Malaysia, that's a very different thing compared to if BMW is, is uh, shutting down uh, its car manufacturing facility in China, for example. Um, so if there's something you can do there, I think. Um, some other suggestions is simply look at the uh, activity of these firms in Europe. Uh, you know, what's the, the value added uh, of, of these firms relative to GDP uh, in Europe? Um, how much labor do they employ in Europe? At least I would be very curious to, to see this and how this evolves over time too. Um, okay, episodes. So you mentioned this, you group together uh, uh, years where you see uh, changes in the number of affiliates for, for a multinational uh, because you see firms changing affiliates all the time. Um, and I think you could justify this a little bit more. Like, why do you do it? I think I know the reason. It's simply because, well, you have this event study approach and, and if you don't group them into episodes, you have, you have events all the time, right? But maybe you could discuss this a little bit more. Um, are people using this kind of approach in the literature? What are the pros and cons, for example? Um, another issue that I think is a little bit more uh, serious, perhaps, um, relates to this table four. I don't, think, I don't think you showed this, but this is essentially uh, counting uh, uh, the number of multinationals uh, with, for example, a zero change in the number of affiliates. That would be the first row. And in the last row, you have the number of affiliates where you have 11 changes. So that's basically that they're changing their number of affiliates every year in your panel. And you see that, well, you only have 906 firms here, so there are not that many of them. But these guys, these are the really, really, really important firms in Europe. Uh, so you see that their average number of affiliates is 60. So they have basically affiliates everywhere. Um, now, in your approach, you're basically going to drop these firms because you, you, know, you have just one episode. One episode, there's one thing going on throughout the, all the years in, in your sample. Um, so, yeah, so in, in, again, going back to the question about like the aggregate impacts and employment in Europe and so forth, uh, it's, it's a little bit unfortunate that you rule out all these like really, really big firms. Um, Okay, um, the event study. Um, so you didn't show this picture, but this is the same event study, but here we look at expansions inst instead of contractions. And it's value added on the left and labor on, on the right. Um, now, <clears throat> you see here that you have, you know, when you expand, well, you expand actually before you expand, and you expand a little bit after you expand, but it kind of plateaus, it seems. And in a paper, you are careful that you're, you're using the wording associated with and not necessarily caused by when you're doing this event study approach. Um, but I think perhaps you could, like, I think one solution is to be even more careful, but because I don't think you want policymakers to take this as evidence that contractions are, are, are bad or good or, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> Uh, simply because there could be demand shocks or other things that is driving this, this thing. So even if you didn't expand, maybe employment in Europe would grow anyway. Um, perhaps another more 
ambitious approach would be to say, hey, let's, let's have an instrument for expansions or, or an instrument for contractions. And I think actually you can do that because, well, you know where these affiliates are located and you probably know something about demand shocks uh, uh, in those industries and in those countries where they're operating. Uh, so that seems to be like a very straightforward and feasible approach to have a more uh, like some exogenous variation in, in expansions or, or contractions. So I would highly encourage you to, to look at that. Um, okay, this is my last slide. Um, <clears throat> uh, keeping you from, from lunch. Um, so, uh, so nearshoring. So uh, you say that multinational networks increasingly show a broad-based tendency towards nearshoring. Uh, but again, I think you should be a little bit careful with the language here. So if you look at these plots, let's take the left one. So that's uh, just the change in the average distance from your European firm to your affiliates. And I think like the, the line there inside the box, that's the change for the median firm, okay? And you see that from 2010, it's maybe hard to see from 2010 to uh, 2016, I guess, or 15, that little line is a little bit above one. So actually what that means is that average, or the median distance to your uh, affiliates is actually going up during this period. Um, and then 2017, 18, 19, it seems to be more or less exactly on the zero line, which means for the median multinational again, there's no change in physical distance to, to your affiliates. And you see more or less the same thing when you're using this, this measure of uh, geopolitical uh, distance. It is true that these boxes tend to go down a little bit, so I'm not saying that you're wrong, but I'm saying I would be a little bit careful with the language here. Another interpretation is that, well, actually, these networks are becoming more uh, geographically dispersed over this decade, um, uh, but perhaps that there's a slight slowdown in that dispersion over the last, um, over the last few years. Uh, final comment, I would be very interested in just looking at, say, one important country, like China. Like, what, what, uh, what does the, the share of of Chinese affiliates look like over this time period, or you could pick some other countries that point more to this, this directly to these issues about the trade war and geopolitical tensions. Okay, I'll uh, end there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andreas.